celebration of the liturgy of Our Lady Undoer of Knots. Today is the solemnity of the Ascension of the Lord. Our Lady Undoer of Knots is an inclusive Catholic faith community open to all who walk through our doors with respect. We are also the Baltimore chapter of Dignity USA, which is dedicated to the sacramental and social justice for the LGBTQ community, their families, and friends. Our vision is to rebuild church, uh, Christ's church by seeking out and providing an accepting, accommodating, and aspirational spiritual home for disenchanted, disenfranchised, disengaged, disaffected Catholics and others in the Baltimore metro area. Let us take a moment to pause, be silent, place ourselves in the presence of God as we prepare for the liturgy to begin. Our celebrant this evening is Father Steve Staley, uh, and our co-celebrant is our pastor, Father Al Ristorfer. Please stand. Please join us to sing our gathering hymn, number 748, What is This Place? That's number 748, in the green gathering.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, our minds were prepared for the coming of your kingdom when you took Christ beyond our sight so that we might see him in his glory. May we follow where he has led and find our hope in his glory for he is Lord forever and ever. Amen. 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 You see. He had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This is Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven. He will come uh, back the same way you saw him go into heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Responsorial psalm this evening is God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Clap your hands, all you peoples, shout to God with loud songs of joy, for the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all the earth. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God is king over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. God, God has gone up with a shout. The, the Lord, Lord with the sound of the trumpet. trumpet.
Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know. So that the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his grace? God put this, work, this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him uh, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head of all over all things which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Please stand. And so we come to the Feast of the Ascension. We're coming to the, the end of the Easter season, the season of joy and light and hope and promise, moving quickly toward another great feast, that of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is unleashed upon the church and the ministry that Jesus had begun is turbocharged as it goes out into the world. As the years have rolled by, my thinking about the Feast of the Ascension has evolved, as most things do over the course of a lifetime. And one thing that I've always associated with the Feast of Ascension is the idea of, of paradox, holding two things that seem to be opposed in tension. And so many of the paradoxes of the Easter season, I think, come to their 
fulfillment in the Feast of the Ascension. There's the mystery of arrival and departure, light and darkness, presence and absence, absence and presence. The deep, deep mystery of suffering and death and then the liberation from those things. It all seems to be wrapped up in the ascension when the earthly phase of the work of Christ Jesus is completed and he is taken back, back to the Father, but leaving those who remain with a very firm commission to take that word out into the world. And on that theme of paradox, I'd like to pivot, if I might, back to the gospel we had this evening from the 16th chapter of Mark. It is probably one of the more challenging gospels to read in all of the New Testament because of the signs that the risen Christ lays out there that will be indicative of the power that his disciples will take out into the, into the world. I mean, there's some pretty heavy stuff here. There is um, exercising demons. There is drinking toxic substances, drinking poison, healing, speaking in tongues, and my favorite of all, handling snakes, picking up deadly serpents. And if you'll bear with me, I'd like to pivot for just a minute on that. I'd like to go there. I'd like to go to the snakes. No snakes on a plane, but snakes in the gospel. That's what I'd like to go to for a few minutes. I guess it was about, I dated from when our daughter was born, because I somehow came across this book around the time Sarah was born in 96 or 97. But I read a review of it, and I found the book. And boy, what a read it was. The book was called Salvation on Sand Mountain. And the theme of the book is the snake handlers of Appalachia. And the author, a very adventurous journalist, a guy named Dennis Covington, who hailed from the South. I believe he was originally from the Birmingham area. But he had been a, uh, a war correspondent. He had done journalism in some pretty hot spots around the world. And I forget whether he was working for the AP or the UPI or what, whatever. When a story came across his desk about a trial, and I believe it was, I'm hoping it was Northern Alabama and not Southern West Virginia, because I live in West Virginia now, so I'm, I'm hoping it was Northern Alabama, um, closer to where Dennis is from originally. But the trial is about a pastor of one of these snake handling churches who was accused of trying to kill his wife by snake bite, of all things. I mean, he was taking some props from the church, I guess, and was going to try to off his wife. Pretty, pretty awful stuff. So that is, the, that is the thing that lures him to follow this story. But what happens, and I'd like to go a little more deeply into this, is that he goes down there to investigate this trial, but he cannot escape his fascination and his interest in the people who conduct this kind of worship. And like all good journalists, he writes with a style that draws you in. And I'm not sure what Covington pursued since those days, but he would make a wonderful mystery writer because of his ability to use suspense to bring you into the story. And over the course of the story, what happens is he starts to go to these services, these snake handling services, and he describes them in vivid detail. And the churches are always very small. They are, they're held, the services are held like cinder block buildings without much garnish in them. Uh, the lights are very, very harsh. There's a lot of fluorescent lights overhead. Um, the services are often accompanied by ear-splitting rock music. And people get into this, into this mode, into the spirit. I believe there is also speaking in tongues. But what, what begins to happen is a bit of what I would describe as a frenzy. I mean, people really get into this, and it sort of takes on a life of its own. And as you're reading the story, you begin to suspect that the author is under the spell of whatever it is that happens in these churches. And that's exactly what happens. 
And spoiler alert here, in the event that you run out and buy the book, the, the journalist actually becomes part of the story because he feels called at one point to step forward and as a witness to take one of these snakes in his hands. And these, these are big snakes. I mean, he's got it in his hands. And with that, that journalistic eloquence, he describes the writhing of the snake and his own shallow breathing. And in one of the descriptions, he talks about the snake actually moving toward the ceiling of this church, like going up into the light. And Covington feels himself kind of being drawn up with the snake. I mean, it's, it's a moment that sort of shuts out space and time and everything that we would judge to be anywhere near normal. And let me say that one of the things that kept me reading was the tremendous respect that Covington had for these people. There was nothing patronizing. There was nothing condescending. He wasn't about to turn this into some kind of a freak show and ridicule these people. He was simply trying to understand what it is that would pull human beings into something like this. And the, the interest on his part ran so deep that he himself takes up a serpent. And I think he does it two or three times. And then he steps back away from it. He goes to the hotel where he's staying, he finishes his piece, and he goes back and moves ahead with the book. Now, having shared that with you, I just want to say one more thing about this, and then I'm going to come back, if I can, to the feast that we celebrate, the Ascension. A few weeks after I finished reading the book, which, again, I found to be spellbinding, I heard an interview with Dennis Covington on NPR, and he was being interviewed by a very, very skillful journalist, radio journalist, broadcast journalist. And the part that I want to share with you is the journalist asked him how had his image of Christianity changed as a result of this? And then we, we come to understand that Dennis Covington grew up in the church in Birmingham. I believe he was part of a Southern Baptist congregation. So kind of a traditional upbringing in that part of the country. Um, currently, I think he's a part of a Methodist congregation, I believe somewhere either in New York or perhaps in Alabama. But here's the part that has really captured my imagination. When he was asked how had this experience changed his understanding of Christianity. He paused, and he said, well, he said, I, I, I don't feel called to be part of that particular kind of worship, but I feel that those people saw themselves as disciples and were trying to act on that discipleship, which I thought was interesting. And then he said, but the deeper thing is, I came to believe that you cannot have Christianity in whatever flavor without two things. And those two things are mystery and danger. He said, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, there are two characteristics that have to inform that decision. One is mystery and one is danger. Let me, in my own way, try to elaborate on that. My takeaway was, when he used that word danger, I don't for a second believe that anyone can or, or has to pick up snakes to feel danger. I mean, I, I, I think if there's an extreme compulsion to do that, I guess you can do it. But I think dealing with danger is part and parcel of the human experience that we all go through. Human life is risky. Human life itself is volatile. Human life itself makes demands. But you take all those things and you amplify them when you dare to say, I am a Christian, of whatever strength. Because you're saying, this is who I follow. This, this person, this prophet, this Jewish rabbi, who came with this specific message and paid the ultimate price for it, this is the person I follow. Well, 
That requires something of us to say that. Because there's no way that you can say it and mean it if you're not willing to take a few steps, at least, in that direction. And acknowledge that to follow this Lord, to follow this Master, is going to require something of us. And that comes with danger. That comes with a heightened danger because we're putting ourselves on the line, stating a belief, and then attempting to follow it. And the other side of the coin is mystery. The author Covington said how difficult it was for him to go back to his regular church life after visiting the snake handlers of Appalachia. He said, it all seems so tame. It all seems so contained. It seems so tranquil. Just to go in and sit in the pew and put my offering in and to go home and feel like I'm, I'm, really, I'm really living according to the gospel. He makes the point that his experience in Appalachia taught him that at the heart of this whole enterprise is a mystery. A mystery that far surpasses our ability to describe it in any human words, in any kind of human ritual, even in any book. It surpasses all that. When those things are doing what they should, they bring us to the edge of awe. But we should never lose that sense of awe. Because this mystery that has summoned us is bigger than any of us. It's bigger than the world. Bigger than the cosmos. So, we celebrate a feast where the Lord transcends from one plane of being to another. How can you even begin to understand that? The gospel writers, the evangelists did their very best and they did a great job, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But they were still up against the limits. And we have to take that as the point of departure, not the end, not the end. And the other piece of it is that we were given a commission. This is who you are. This is how you are defined. So you have to do something about it. You've got to build this thing here. You've got to take some chances. You've got to get out there and work for this. As Father Al said so eloquently, love implies action. It impels us to action. And you know, in the time I've been with you here at Our Lady on New York Knots, I feel that we really have something here. We really have something here. And I'm not sure... I'm pretty sure that we're bursting to share that. We want to let people know this is a place where you can come and you can experience the mystery and find hope and joy in it. And we can take it out. We can take it out. We can build it. We can take it out into the world. We really, really can. So again, in finishing, no need to mess with snakes. Um, I think Mike throws enough snakes at us anyway in various forms. Leave that to your imagination. Um, but we'll handle them. We'll keep handling them. And we'll keep taking ourselves to greater states of reverence and awe for the mystery at the heart of all this. And then we'll get busy. We'll take it out there. And we'll bring in those who I know need what we have. our second week. Um, grow the church feeds. One, two, three, four. I know if Martha had been here, we would have been a fifth. 
That's a 500% improvement from last week where there was only one. <laughs> so um, if we're going to go bring about this church, grow this church, one thing, one person, each person, per week, one email, one text, one meeting, one phone call, one project, one something. Write it down. Bring it to the boss. I thank you, everyone. Let's keep up the good work. We go church for the Let's get on with it. Having heard and reflected on the Holy Word of God, let us join together in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is to be seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, our life from life, true God from true God, begotten and not made. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came back to heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became human. For our sake, he was crucified and brought to Father. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in the fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We will believe in the Holy Spirit, who will roll over and give our life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who the Father and the Son and the Spirit is worshipped and glorified, and has spoken through our process. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We believe in one of the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead. Let us rejoice in the ascension of the Lord and be grateful for all that the Lord has bestowed upon us, just as we are cognizant of those who have less. We turn to the Lord with grateful thanks. For peace in our world and an end to hatred and oppression, we pray to the Lord. The Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. For our families and all that they have done for us, Especially for our moms who have nurtured us so well, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For our nation, that it may put division aside and renew our sense of justice, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Our prayer. For an end to the pandemic that is ravaging our world, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For a renewed sense of our mission to follow Christ's commandment at his ascension, to preach the gospel to all peoples, to seek those who are lost and offer them a new spiritual home, especially the LGBT communities, in, especially LGBTQ Catholics in Baltimore, who are facing rejection by their faith leaders, the Roman Church. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. For each of us to find time and the strength and the will to do grow the church deeds this week, as we work towards building our community, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear, Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who support our parish and our mission with their time, talent, and treasure, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For the gift of new life for the deceased, especially for Pat Marin's wife and Anna Mae Simmons, we also pray for the victims of senseless violence and hate. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. <coughs> for all prayers we hold in our hearts, for all those who have petitioned our lady and doer of knots by way of our website, especially for the intentions of Jason, Vanessa, AJ, Clarine, Mary, Angel, and Rosaline, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. For the gift of healing for all who are sick and comfort for the dying, especially for Henry, Phil Grace, 
Blair Freed, Sandy Williams, Kim Penna, and Chris Mowry's mother, for Karen Conrad, Lisa Staley, Ron Stevens, Natia, and Don Pratt's dad, for Bob Scales, Angel Bishop, and Chris Emery's mother, we pray to the Lord. For whom or what else shall we pray this evening? I'd like to ask for prayers for uh, a family friend, Frank Geist, who passed away last night, that uh, his wife can find comfort knowing that he's in a better place. For an end to the violence of the Middle East, like the Palestine and now Israel. For the people in India who are suffering especially hard from the COVID-19 resources and healing may come soon to them. I ask for prayers for a friend from work as her best friend his daughter is just recently put on an organ transplant list. And then lastly, let's celebrate our uh, Philadelphia Dignity Chapter, who celebrates 47 years tonight. For all of these prayers, spoken and unspoken, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear your prayer. prayer. Loving Father, you alone are the source of life, and you abundantly bless your creation with happiness and joy. May we always turn to you in thanksgiving for all that we are and all that we have received through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for your goodness we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine and the work of human hands, it will become ours. Blessed be God forever. Pray, brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to the Lord, our Almighty God. May the Lord accept sacrifice to your hands, for the praise of Lord God's name, for our good and of all God's church. Lord, receive our offering as we celebrate the ascension of Christ your Son. May his gifts help us rise with him to the joys of heaven, where he lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also, also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Father, all powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks in Jesus Christ our Lord. We praise you with greater joy than ever in this Easter season, when Christ became our pastoral sacrifice. In him a new age was dawned. The long reign of sin is ended. A broken world has been renewed, and humanity is once again made whole. The joy of the resurrection renews the whole world, while the choirs of heaven sing forever to your glory. 
as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the kingdom of God, our own glory, 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 now and now and forever. Lord Jesus, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also to you. Let's welcome each other in silence.
you saw in the email, if uh, some of you could hang around to go to all the next. <coughs> I'll talk about what happened in our feelings about the uh, meeting on Wednesday. Uh, not to mention, I think the board's meeting with the thing all over this week. So uh, let's have a little chat about that and maybe a few other things as we continue to explore our own unique identity as a, as a community. Let us pray. Father, in this Eucharist, we touch the divine life and give the world. Help us to follow Christ with love to eternal life. He is Lord forever and ever. Amen. 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 Please join us as we pray and sing to Our Lady under a knot at our icon. We will actually sing number 447, Regina Chaley. We'll first do it in Latin and then after praying we'll do it in English.
Leaders, please let us go forth in song as we sing number 453 in the gathered book. A hymn of glory, let us sing. Again, that's number 453. A hymn of glory, let us sing. Thank you. 